And after that, I moved to Germany to complete a PhD, still in theoretical physics, and then uh, joined one of the youngest university in Germany, Duisburg Essen, for a postdoc in the Faculty of Chemistry. So I'm a physicist working with chemists to understand catalytic process on surfaces. So um, I've been very involved in science communication in Africa. And then the motivation was first interesting because after traveling all around the world, I could notice the big gap, the difference of level in the scientific cultures from one continent to another. And then I also came to the conclusion that what is missing uh, between the scientists that we find in Africa, who are also good scientists spread all over the world, and the decision making is, uh, they say, an energy missing, and this energy is a scientific culture. And then science communication is something that can help building that connecting energy between those who decide and the scientists, what they can do. And then it's also very important to do science communication because nowadays science communication is subjected to many things. First, the dynamics of the market of scientific information, publishing and, and, and other things, and also the dynamics of new information and communication technologies. So platforms and support for communications are, are, are changing very fastly. And then so science communication should adapt in many ways. So because of uh, the discrepancies between the various societies, between the differences between national or regional science policies, even on some continents, and also because of the migratory nature of people who produce the knowledge and people who communicate the knowledge. And because of that, more engagement is needed. So scientists should really start thinking about getting out of the lab and it's also important for people who take decision within the scientific sphere to it's time to understand that scientists should not decide anymore either to do science or to communicate science. So science communication should be part of the evaluation of, of, of scientists. So uh, what I've noticed uh, over the years is that um, trying to communicate science is a four body interaction. So first you have to try to <laughs> interact with your colleague scientists themselves. Um, you have to interact with the general public. You have to interact with decision makers. And it's actually uh, a very dynamic interaction and then defining the potential between the various bodies here is what we know is a procedure that goes under the name that we all know as engagement and communication. So one has to practice, right? and then to apply various forms of communication. Diversifies a bit because it depends really on sometimes the cultural anthropology of people to whom you want to communicate science. And then, so today I will briefly share what I've been doing uh, concerning with respect to all these different interactions and try to also mention what I've learned and then the perspective that I see behind science communication and with the focus on Africa, because this is where I'm more involved. So you see that we have three levels of interaction, as I just mentioned, for this four-body interaction interactic system. So I will start with the first one, interactions or communication among the scientists themselves. So how, I mean, the most, the most, I mean, uh, common thing that we do, and then since if we perceive knowledge as a common good of mankind. So wherever knowledge is produced, it should belong to everybody on earth. So, I mean, diffusing knowledge is the responsibility of every scientist. This is the most trivial or for me, the most basic form of communication, right? Translating, I mean, uh, bringing knowledge to everyone's reach, even to people who don't have access to knowledge evolution. This is what we do since four to six years, actually. So we go to Africa, and then try to teach new techniques developed in Europe or in the US or in parts of the world where uh, there are possibility to advance, to advance science. So we go to Africa, to Central Africa, and then we teach the Schrodinger equation to students, how they can use, how they can go beyond equations, right? Use their computers, even their PCs, 
right? To study the properties of material. And then we don't only teach physics. We also try to communicate to decision makers. And then Africa is very peculiar when it comes to take decisions. Because when there are elections, people who want to be, let's say, president or lawmakers or whatsoever, they go to what we call cultural leaders. So these are the people who lead communities. So these are the people who sometimes order their community to vote for someone or someone else. So we go to these people, we invite them to these schools, we try to ask them to value education, knowledge transfer by ennobling the people who come and teach, I mean, my European colleagues, to put the value into education, into knowledge transfer, into science, and also to tell them that whenever uh, voting will come, they should think about asking the people who will be on power to also fund science locally, right? Because we never, we not always expect uh, funding to come from abroad. So we should start thinking about also local solutions. And then during these schools also, we try to take, select good students that we bring um, in the US or in Europe and try to empower them and encourage them to go back maybe after five years after their PhD or their postdoc. And then also give back the knowledge that they, that, that they acquired. So this is the form that I guess everybody uh, is aware of, that everybody practice. Another one is about um, uh, crossing the borders between the different physical communities, right? So, and physical expertise also. Uh, I will take the case of Africans. How do Africans vehiculate what they do, African physicists? This is something that was not done some years ago. People in the US or in Europe didn't know what are the Africans doing? It doesn't mean that the, the Africans are not existing. They are there, they do good science. They, I mean, they empower people in Africa, but people wanted to know what they are doing. And then came the idea uh, about, uh, I mean, uh, setting up a vehicle of information, right? I mean, to diffuse information about what physicists are doing in Africa or in the African diaspora. So this is how came the ideas of the African Physics Newsletter, which actually is a quarterly published by the APS, and then which works as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide here. We have an advisory board actually made up of people, experienced scientists from Africa or from the US. And then the founder of the newsletter is uh, in the audience today. And so and we have, uh, two editors per region, as defined by the African Union, who try to, I mean, collect articles, invite colleagues to write about, to report about the science or physics life in general, in their locality, in their regional, um, in, in their regions or in their country. So we publish the newsletter every every three months. And then uh, the good thing to, to have set up this newsletter is that um, now, uh, as you can see uh, from, from here, uh, the, newsletter, the newsletter reports on many different things. So not only capacity building, but also networking happening, infrastructure startup. For example, we take the case of this, uh, what happened recently in Cameroon. So there was a physicist who got, I think it was a million euro funding from Bill Gates right, to set up a drug discovery center. So he's supposed to scan all the therapeutic potentials of the Cameroonian pharmacopy, right? The plants to see their therapeutic potential and then to compile it some, somewhere. And then, and then this could be the beginning, right? Of computer assisted <coughs> drug discovery based on Cameroonian plants. So we also report on people achieving great work, right? Going to, I mean, Sahelian regions in Northern Africa and try to, 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 to provide the blue gold to people. By blue gold, I mean water, right? We also, um, I mean, report on how a nuclear physics, for example, is used to fight against poachers in South Africa and so on and so forth. And uh, this is quite uh, interesting in the sense that uh, at a certain point, we were asking ourselves, do we inform only the community or do we communicate to the community? Because information is a one we process why communication is a two-way process. And then here we came to understand that we are actually communicating with the, not only with the African community, but also with the rest of the world. Because if we keep publishing the APN and then we don't get 
arrays of interest, right, in providing article, I think we should have worried. But you will see that over the years, this is, I'm not saying that APN <laughs> has invaded the world, as you can see in the blue <laughs> color here. But just to tell you that in every country, in this blue marked, um, every, in, in each of these blue marked countries in the world, they are subscribers of the APS. Right, there are some people who are, I mean, interested in what we publish, and then there are also some physicists from there. Not only Africans, but also people working on African, on topics relevant for Africa, that are interacting with us. And uh, we, now uh, we 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 have uh, around a thousand subscribers. It's not yet to the level of the. Of the Physics Today magazine, right, which I think circulates the fifteen thousands or to to the level of the FIP newsletter, which circulates five thousand, if I remember well. But we are coming gradually and with a good speed. And then you will see that almost half of the subscribers are, of course, from Africa, but one quarter come from the US. This tells you about the strong relation that the APS has with the continent. It's not only because the APN is published by the APS, but also because there are a lot of projects going on between the United States of America and Africa. And many of these projects are reported in the newsletter. So now on the continental point of view, Africa actually has 54 states. And then over the years, we have been devoting our energy to reach out people in all the African countries. And one of the problems is that point contact right, is a big issue. Because on the continent you have, let me call it 16 national societies of physics. And it's very difficult to reach people in countries where you don't have national society of physics. There are individuals who sacrifice their career to build up physics curriculums in Africa. There are many of them. They don't do research anymore because they have to build a physics curriculum. And then we have been able to reach out this type of people all over the continent, particularly in Gabon, in Chad, in Mauritius, for example, recently we just noticed that uh, since the 1990s, there is no physics curriculum in Somalia after the war. So after the war, everything was destroyed. And then and now they are trying 30 years after to build up some, I mean, a curriculum. So these are the kind of information that are very precious for us because then it tells the world what is happening and then what we should put more energy and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, as you can notice from the red marks here, there are still some country where we face inertia. Scientists on one side who are not interested or maybe who don't realize the importance of a communication via a newsletter, or I mean, who, who uh, I mean, are just not interested, I would say this way. So there are countries like Eritrea, I'm not sure if there are physics curriculum there, in, in, in Central Africa, I know for sure that there is a physics curriculum. They strongly depend on Cameroon, but uh, there is a small community building up there. So we are trying to get them out and speak about what they are doing. So you see, in some in five years, four years now, we have in contact with people in 40 countries in Africa, which actually is a great. And then you can see the distribution of subscribers in Africa. I mean. Uh, most of them come from Cameroon, obviously, because I am from Cameroon, I guess so, and I'm, I'm very active on social media. And so the other ones come from South Africa, and they are more or less distributed in the four corners of Africa. So this is a, also a classical way of circulating information among the scientists themselves, uh, working in different disciplines, so both theoretician, experimentalist, material physicist, or chemical physics like me and so on and so forth. So now, the other point is about once we are able to communicate among us physicists, scientists, how do we convey, I mean, what we do to people who take decision? So I will take you some practical things. So some very effective contact zone and contact scene. It's something happening everywhere in Congo. Among, among the people who think that when Congo will wake up, I mean, Africa will tremble because there's a lot of potential there. Not only people, but also material and energy. And then every year, there is a big event. I like this kind of begin because Africa have come to realize that interaction by contact is one of the best way of communicating. People don't read too much. If you write, nobody 
We read about people who have a particular interest. So what is organized there is one of our editor is doing a brilliant work since 10 years. So she organized science and society event festivals where many actors of the society are invited. For example, I was there last year. You will see the commissioner of science and technology from the African Union is there, right? You will see some soccer players like this one here. He was the cap. The, I mean, I don't know, the, the, the captain of the national team of Congo, of soccer. He was playing for Newcastle in England. And then you will see a lady here. She's the African champion of judo, right? So they come here all together. It's a good contact zone because many different actors come. So science is the interface between everybody. Discussions are made. And then there are clear prescriptions made by a scientist there about what should be the direction to be taken so that science drives the development of society. A country like Congo, if this happens there, if they find a recipe for a science-driven development of their society, they would, this would be a good prototype to be exported everywhere in Africa. I particularly like it because there, you see also students, the future generation are there. Scientists come from all over the world. They meet there, they interact, and then they discuss about uh, uh, many things. So this is a summary on the left-hand side here about what is actually concretely done there. So another way is to prescribe re recommendations, right? So establish kind of roadmap, right, for physics. And then this is what has been done recently by a group of African physicists spread all over the world. Most of them are abroad, apart from Farida, who is in Morocco. And then now they have been able to gather more than 200 physicists. I'm also working in this uh, African strategy about how, uh, I mean, what are the strategic direction for physics, right? Education and research for a sustainable future. So we have been writing proposal, uh, white papers, and then we are in the final stage of this, um, of this uh, initiative who has last now for three years. We started in 2019. And then this initiative had the support of many um, society around the world. So, and, and, uh, so the, the idea is to, is, to, is to end up with the kind of document that we can submit to people uh, at the African Union and then in, at every African country level, right? About what should be the physics to be done for a sustainable future to Africa. So either you invite the decision makers and talk to them directly, for sure they will forget the next day after, or either you write a recipe that you send to them. Uh, it's a, actually a pity to, to realize that apart from countries like Ghana, where you can see that scientists sometimes have a word to say when it comes to decision-making. I remember Professor Halute, that uh, Professor Jojo knows very well. He was uh, a scientist that was, I mean, he could say a word, right, when it came to decision, right, at the, even at the presidential level. But in, in other countries, it's not the case. And I'll explain why. So, you see, in 40 years ago, there was this a similar initiative like the one I just mentioned. So people gathered in Lagos, right? And then they tried to answer the same question. What should we do, right, to for a, a science and technology-driven development of Africa. And then there was the so-called Lagos plan, where some recommendations were made. I think but they were the recommendations were mostly made on the financial point of view. So how much money should we invest into science right, for a better future? And then this was the recommendation. But no, no country in Africa followed this recommendation. You see, people, the recommendation actually was to devote this amount of the gross thematics product, 1% to science and development. They were never to follow. And then the people who are close to that, the countries that are close to that is Egypt and South Africa. They, they devote something like 0 0.4 or 0 0.5, I don't remember very well. And then you see that these are the countries where science, I mean, where people can clearly see the contribution to the, of, uh, of, of uh, their contribution to, to, the, to, to, the, to, to the scientific production in the world. Uh, don't forget that Africa still produces around 1% to 2%, according to Elsevier, in, the, for, in terms of scientific production. And then this is a clear consequence of 
how much is invested in this. People tend to forget that there is a linear there is a clear connotation correlation, if you want, between how much you invest into science, scientific development, technological progress, and um, and and social social progress. So, and then this also has repercussions also on the density of scientists per million in Abitan in Africa. You can see that we are still at about 200 scientists per million in Abitan, while the average in the world is around 2,000. So there's, uh, we should go beyond words. We should take action. And then taking action is either interacting by contact or do prescription that we can follow ourselves. So the essential is not just to write proposals, but also to follow them and try to commit decision makers. And then this is really country dependent. If you go to one country to another, I mean, it's different to achieve this. But anyway, the most important is for physicists for first to sit and then think about the strategic direction and then to do the recommendation. So this is another aspect. So now the more important way I'm actually very, very involved, more important to me, I would say, is about uh, how to interact with the general public because the general public, this is where I believe there's more power potential to change the society. I strongly believe that non-scientific community are the one that we should empower if you want really to change the society because they are the majority. And also this is where we can really create vocation, inspire young ones. And then most of the decision makers in a continent like Africa, most of them are, non, are not scientists. A few of them have advisory council or stuff like that. The only that I know is, for example, one of our editor that I just showed in the previous slide was a scientific advisor of one of the president in Congo, when Congo was at the head of African Union. This is one of the rare cases where I see physicists or scientists in general advising a president on the African continent. So how to go around that? I mean, decision makers usually, they believe on the crowd, right? They follow the crowd, and then they surf on the crowd. So if you empower the crowd, you have a chance, right? <laughs> you have a chance to, to make a room for science in the decisional sphere. So this is why, um, I mean, uh, communicating with the general public is important. So, and then in the general public, it's not only people who are not educated, they are also educated audience, but who are doing different things. They can be expert in anthropology or, I don't know, in literature and so on and so forth. So how do we address educated audience? There are many formats. So uh, there are soft skills that uh, scientists and particularly physicists should acquire. We should <laughs> start to teach the younger generation how to convey science out of uh, laboratories or out of uh, universities or educated scientific audience. And then, so this is something we have initiated very recently, master class on public outreach in Europe. So we go around some European university in a framework of a collaboration called Aurora, it's sponsored by the European Union. And then we teach students about how to, I mean, uh, make their topic easy, right, to digest to other people, to other audiences. So, and then this incorporates or encapsulates many things. So the storytelling to, I mean, filmmaking or, I mean, communication with arts and so on and so forth. So we, 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 I mean, we really do different formats that I will show very quickly after that. And then with ICTP in Italy now, so, so seeing some years, we are now organizing courses on professional and professional trainings for communication skills for, for young students. So this course is an online course devoted to everybody from the developing world. And then we invite ex experts, right, to teach um, the student or to train them how to improve their communication on social medias, new information technologies, how to manage conflicts, because communication is also how you work with colleagues or how you interact with people. So these are the topics that we cover, as you can see here. So uh, if you go um, um, uh, very recently now, um, we, we also started something with the European Spallation Sources. 
So I have a house production for movie, and we we try to produce short movies with uh, scientists, experienced scientists of in various fields who come and talk for three to four minutes, summarize their research, the importance for the society, and we upload it on YouTube. And then uh, this is also a soft skill training for students. So to copy what these experts are doing. And then the aim is to train them to hold the mic by mic and being magnetic, inspiring, and convincing. But this kind of initiative needs funding, which is never there. Scientists always unfortunately look at this kind of initiative very snobbishly. Many still think that it's not useful, while it's the opposite. So what the last point now is about non-scientific community. What I do actually is that um, pop science is something that can be achieved using movies, for example. For example, if you take Hollywood, when people see when people people hear about Hollywood, they think about movies with characters like like Schwarzenegger and so on and so forth. But I was very surprised when I went to Hollywood some years ago to attend the APS meeting. I went to the mountain. I was actually going there to take a photo right with this Hollywood map, and then I was surprised to see an observatory, right? And then I asked about the story. This is how I come to learn that <clears throat> actually uh, it was for scientific observations, right, in the, in the sky that this observatory was there. And then Hollywood in the form that we know nowadays came later. And then I came also, uh, it made me to go and dig back in history why the cinema was invented. And I was very surprised to see that the pioneers of cinema were actually physicists. And then, because when I started doing movies in Africa and I was trying to bring the movies or sell it to televisions, they were always asking me, you physicist, why, what are you doing in the movie industry? And so I was thinking that this was not the right place to be. But actually, it's the right place to be because we have abandoned this fair, which is actually ours. So if you know, I mean, most of you here should know about the story of the brother Limiers. So how the cinematoscope was invented and how about the rest between Edison and the brother Limiers in the creation of the cinematograph. But actually, my role model here is Henri Penlevé. He's a French guy who was using the cinematoscope, the kinematograph, sorry, to study, uh, I mean, the, the marine life. He was actually a marine biologist. So he was going underwater and trying to film how the species they are living, how they reproduce, how they feed themselves. And then he was organizing some projections in France. So this was actually the beginning of the cinema. So it's inspired by that, that some years after I first wrote a novel, actually my mother tongue is French. So I'm a novelist also. So I wrote novels for secondary school students. And then we brought that novel to the cinema. So after I wrote the novel, I contacted some professionals from the movie industry, right, who wrote scenarios right, based on this novel. And then we brought it to, 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 to the movie. Uh, we, we made a movie out of it, the movie series, actually. So, I mean, why did I do it? Because as I told you, I believe that the potential to change the society lies in non-scientific community. So actually, uh, it's like working on a machine on a computer. So the computer has much more power to do what humans cannot do, provided that you tell the computer what, what to do, right? So the project that I was heading, or I'm still heading, uh, entitled Making Science the Star, is actually trying to connect scientists, professionals of the movie industry, and the general public. Because when you work with celebrities from the movie industry, they work as multipliers, right, of what you want to convey, because they are followed by millions of people, and then they can create vocations. They can also talk to decision makers. And this is what has happened in Cameroon. So we select how does it work? We organize meetings between professionals of the movie industry and scientists. For example, some years ago, we were in EMS Cameroon. EMS is an African Institute for Mathematical Sciences spread all over Africa, Ghana, Cameroon, Rwanda, and so on. And then there we go, we talk to scientists. 
they tell us about what they do, the science that they do, how they think that this can impact the society, and then we try to disseminate it using movie series. So after this kind of meeting encounters, so we write scenarios and then people act as you can see here. And then we try to adapt to depict the reality also in Africa about how people conceive science, right? Superstition, science journalism, but also the success of innovative ideas. Right? And I had to act in this movie because at the end it's a combination of fiction and cinematographic storytelling because at the end I come like a reference, a giving reference where I mean the technology that or the concept that we are disseminating is coming from who has done that and so on and so forth. So and then with this, you see, we could make a room, right, for science in the movie industry in Africa. For the first time, uh, you'll see something related to science, right? Because this is a kind, this is what we are, this is kind of Netflix, but for Africa. It's called Cinema Africa. And then if you can Google and see for the first time something addressing basic science there. Right. So we did the movie in French and then we dubbed it into English. So the idea is to bring science to everyone rich, right? Empower people, right? Raise the interest, right? And then do it more and more, more and more. But hopefully this will have an impact. And it has had an impact already. So we have been campaigning also in Africa because the target is not only to tell the scientists to go out of the lab. We, to, 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 we, it's not only to empower non-scientific communities, also to talk to our colleagues from Africa to get out of the lab and engage for science. And then you see all these people you see in the forefront here, these are celebrities in my home country, right? They have been campaigning in African university, going and exchanging with physicists in Congo, in Benin, and Togo or Burkina Faso, and talking to them about how the general public is perceiving what we do as scientists. So to push also the scientists to get out of the lab. So it was actually funny to see this movie celebrity giving seminars in universities, right? I think this is also something important so that scientists understand the way they are understood outside. So we have been in a couple of African countries and we are invited to other ones, but funding is still the problem. And then on this occasion, we also discuss with the scientists there, and then we write some protocols about ideas, about the research they do, and then and the goal is, as I said, to disseminate it using films. So this is, for example, the last slide, and then here it's a practical example of what we did. So some years ago, I, I came across this paper from a professor in Bristol, because I was in Bristol, and then I went to the university bar, the student bar, and then I didn't see any power supplies. And I was wondering where is the electricity coming from? And then somebody told me about the technology that I did not know before. It's the P power. So using the urine to convert it, right? To convert urine into electricity. So they call it microbial fuel cells and stuff like that. If you go to the student bar in Bristol, they use this kind of uh, fuel cells to, to enlight the, the, the student bar. And then this gave me an idea because if you go in my country, it's sad to say that, but insalubrity is something is a hot topic, right? So the notion of going to the toilets is still to be improved and stuff like that. So uh, one of the episodes was dedicated to this because I tried to follow the scientist who came up with this idea. It's a Greek professor based in England. And then the idea, and then we brought it <laughs> into the movie, right? And then the the synopsis is actually someone who has a bar and then he uses, um, and in, in Africa, for people who have been there, uh, electricity shortage is a big topic here. People can stay for three weeks without electricity. In my home country, not everywhere, right? And then uh, if you have a bar where you use this kind of technology to enlighten your bar, I mean, uh, it's also a way to talk to, to people who can invest in this kind of technology or also, to, for, to the government to, to, to make them think about starting decentralizing energy and democratizing the access to energy uh, because the energy distribution is very centralized till today in my country. So this is actually a, a, a very rough summary of, because I, 
I was told that the discussion here is very informal. So uh, this is a rough summary of what the activities that I do and the, and the level of engagement in which I'm involved. So thank you very much. I hope I was not too long.